Hello and welcome to this week's Home Retreat. I'd like to look at the life of St Benedict as presented in the Dialogues of St Gregory the Great about 50 years after St Benedict's death. There is on our website, on the News Stroke Home Retreats page, a follow-up document to this which can give you some of the references um, and some of the little excerpts I'll be reading out. So if you want to follow up, that's on the News Home Retreats page of the website. When I first started out as a monk in the novitiate, we were told nothing really about the dialogues and the life of St Benedict. I think there was a certain level of embarrassment about this document, as though somehow its level of miraculous detail was uncongenial to the Benedictine spirit of moderation and balance. And sometimes I feel perhaps scripture scholars coming to a text like the Dialogues can bring with them a possibly unhelpful hermeneutic of suspicion where they regard the text as guilty until proved innocent. Coming to it from a background in history, I found it a fascinating document, um, clearly trying to connect with actual events, actual people mentioned in the text, um, references like the spring still flowing today, characters within the text who are related to people that St Gregory knows. So I think rather than simply saying, is it true, I think I'd like to look at some of what St Gregory says as why he's saying it and what can it say to us today. And I'd like to present a sort of threefold structure to look at what the dialogues say, the stories there, to reflect on that and then to finish each section with a little imagined monologue from those encountering Benedict in, in these different situations. So to start with, at the beginning, there was a man whose life was holy. His name was Benedict and he was blessed by grace and by name. From his earliest years, he had the heart of an old man as if he already saw the bloom of the world as a faded thing. He was born into a free man's family in the district of Nursia and was sent to Rome to study the liberal arts. But he saw that many of the students there had fallen into vice. He renounced study, put aside his father's residence and fortune, and desiring to please God alone, went in search of the monastic habit. Thus, he left his studies, learnedly ignorant, and wisely unskilled. He decided to enter the desert, and his nurse, who loved him dearly, was the only one to go with him. So St Gregory dives right in, not at the childhood stage, but really like biblical models of vocation, with the dramatic decision that Benedict makes to abandon his studies. That passage I've just read has these wonderful paradoxes of someone being learnedly ignorant, learnedly ignorant, uh, prematurely aged, someone who spanned those two different stages of life, someone who was prepared to leave not just his home but his inheritance, literally the things of his father. Think of Jesus in the temple saying to his parents, did you not know I must be about my father's business? Benedict realising that his father is not God, that he has to leave his father for himself to become a spiritual father. But also, interestingly, the importance, both at the beginning and at the end of this life of Benedict, the importance of the feminine presence with his nurse accompanying him. I'd just like to imagine a, uh, what she might have been thinking. I had always looked after him from the moment he first opened his lungs and greeted his arrival in the world. His family looked after me, and we prayed together every day. I watched him develop, an intense boy with serious eyes and a gentle heart. He didn't say much, but when he spoke, it was worth listening. It was only natural when it came to him going away to study that I should go with him to make sure that he was all right. But he wasn't all right. He tried to study and he worked hard, but he hated the city. It wasn't just people drinking till they were sick or snatching whatever pleasures they could force from each other. It was the sadness of it all, the desperate grabbing for what was immediate, as though no one had any faith or hope for a future. He knew his own mind. He knew there must be more than this. And so he just left. I had to go with him, though. 
And so Benedict leaves Rome and he heads out to be a hermit. He goes to a place called Subriaco, about 40 miles from Rome. And he makes the acquaintance of a monk from a nearby monastery called Romanus, who's able to look after him. He leaves his faithful nurse behind and uh, desires to join this monastic tradition. So he's not creating or inventing as a sort of spiritual freelancer. But interestingly, his life is not conforming to the rule he later writes, where he says that a hermit has to first go through the stage of living in a community. Benedict reverses that, starts off on his own, and then ends up with communities. But even at this early stage, he's still dependent on Romanus bringing him food and keeping an eye on him. There are wonderful little stories within this of a priest being told in a vision to come and see Benedict um, and to bring him some food because it's Easter. And Benedict replies, I know that it is Easter because I have the honour of seeing you. Far from men, he had overlooked that that day was the solemnity of Easter. So of this man of God, on his own, unaware of the church's calendar. Easter is not just a date in that calendar, it's an internal experience that Benedict was experiencing. And we see these sort of stages of detachment, leaving his family, and in a sense, leaving the church in order to encounter God in this way. He's also visited by some shepherds who are um, surprised at what they find. And here is, again, an imagined monologue. We couldn't believe it when we found him in that cave. At first, we thought we had stumbled across some sort of wild animal. His hair and his beard were so long and his tunic was just rough leather. Once we realised that he was actually a young man and the shock had worn off, he surprised us even more by the way he welcomed us as though he had found something in that cave which he wanted to pass on, as though he could see what really mattered. His body was battered and gaunt, but he seemed peaceful and there was this strange mixture of sadness in his eyes and joy in his voice. We're a pretty crude lot of shepherds, but we now want to go back. During that time in the cave, there is an incident where he's tempted by a particular vision he has of a woman who he had obviously known before he came out to Subiaco. Such a fire was enkindled in the spirit of God's servant at the memory of this beauty that he could no longer contain the flame of love in his heart. He was on the point of deciding to quit the desert. Suddenly, touched by grace from on high, he came back to himself. And noticing close at hand some thick bushes of nettles and brambles, he took off his clothes and threw himself naked among the sharp thorns and fierce nettles. These flesh wounds served as a bodily outlet for the wound in his soul. By this exterior burning, he extinguished the interior fire which was harmful. He vanquished sin by changing one fire into another. When people come across this story in the 21st century, it perhaps makes them rather puzzled, rather sceptical, someone flinging themselves naked into nettles and brambles, and we're tempted to smile and pass on. But there's something profound, I think, in what St Gregory is trying to say about the victories that Benedict experienced and achieved over temptation in this time in the desert. The grace from on high, the divine inspiration, enabled him to come back to himself, that human reality. Perhaps sometimes people going through rehabilitation have to experience some sort of physical pain, some sort of physical effort to enable them similarly to come back to their senses. But with Benedict, it also allows him to go through this sequence of temptation, victory, and then a sort of radiance, which is not just for him, but finally to draw in others. 
And we see this in the dialogues in other different areas of pride and anger. And it's striking how this wild man in this, these chapters of the dialogues becomes the founder of a great monastic Benedictine civilization. Because of what he has experienced, the wisdom he has acquired, some neighboring monks ask him to look after them. Their abbot has died, and they come to Benedict and ask him insistently to become their superior. For a long time, he refused and put them off, as he foretold that his way of life could not fit in with theirs. But eventually, overcome by their entreaties, he agreed. As it turns out, this is not a happy arrangement, and they find that he is too strict for them. They found it unbearable to leave aside their former habitual ways, and in the end, they decide to poison him with a cup of poisoned wine. When Benedict makes the sign of the cross over the cup, it breaks, and he turns to them calmly and says, May Almighty God have mercy on you, brothers. Did I not tell you before that our ways are incompatible? Go and seek a father suitable to your ways. And so he returns to his place of solitude in Subiaco, where he dwelt with himself. That true benefit of solitude, that ability to dwell with yourself. And so finally, he's able to attract the right sort of monks to set up a series of small communities within this valley in Subiaco. And he starts his second monastery. And as St Gregory describes this second monastery, it's clear that St Benedict is at the centre in the sense of leading this, this group of monasteries, but he is wanting to delegate, to enable the other monks to do things. And in many ways, he de-dramatises what's going on. He's a very calm presence in the middle of some quite important events. One of them described is when a young boy um, called Placid falls into the lake at the bottom of the valley. And Benedict realises that something has gone wrong, even though he's up further up the hill, and he asks the young Morris to go down and rescue him. It's a famous story, and here is another reimagining of it from the point of view of Morris, the one who rescues Placid. I still can't believe what happened. In fact, I don't like to talk about it. It's sort of spooky when I'm asked to describe it. At the time, it didn't feel special, and certainly nothing for me to boast about. There were a few of us playing outside the main house when the master suddenly shouted out for me to help. He told me that my friend was drowning in the lake. He was so clear and calm and even had time to bless me and I knew what I had to do. I just ran and ran and dragged him out of the water back to the land. It was only then that I realised that I hadn't just been running over the land. These times in Subiaco I think were some of the most peaceful and satisfying, I suspect, for Benedict. But the local priest, um, Valentinus, didn't like having this man of God in his locality, and again tried to poison Benedict, this time with a loaf of bread. You may know the famous story of how the raven rescues Benedict by taking the bread away. But in the end, Benedict decides it is better to leave. And so he sets up his third monastery, south of Rome, at Monte Cassino. It's interesting that his final monastery is reached after twice two attempts on his life. And it's, I think, important to understand how when Benedict comes to write his rule, I think towards the end of his life, how he draws on all this experience, um, both the strengths and the weaknesses of the communities he's been part of. I think the final move from Subiaco to Monte Cassino is really a shift from the hidden crucible, this narrow valley in Subiaco, to the open view of the heights of Monte Cassino on a hill. And we see this evolution within Benedict from this time of solitude and then a small monastery around him to finally a monastery which is really on the main highway into Rome. 
and how he destroys some of the pagan shrines, how he preaches in the local community, and how he writes his rule. And how his battles with Satan, which in at Subiaco are more hidden, at Monte Cassino become very open and audible. And Satan even feeling that Benedict is persecuting him. Maledict, not Benedict, he shouts. And Gregory describes these encounters with actual historical characters. One of whom, Zala, is a local brigand, um, an Aryan, who is um, really wanting to get his hands on some of the money that Benedict is keeping in the monastery on behalf of the local peasants. And he asks, um, Zala has grabbed a peasant and bound him in order to take him to Benedict's monastery to recover the money. Um, and there's a wonderful description of how Benedict receives Zala. He's sitting at the door of the monastery alone and reading the scriptures. And he looks up and sees this fierce character with this bound peasant coming towards him and shouting, get up and give back to this peasant the goods you have received on his behalf. When he heard this, the man of God raised his eyes from his reading and looked at Zala, then turned his attention to the peasant who was held bound. The cords binding them began to unloose themselves in a marvellous way. The holy man did not get up from his reading, but called the brothers and told them to take Zala inside and give him some blessed bread. When he was brought back, he was told that he ought to desist from such insane cruelty. So this wonderful picture of this abbot on the threshold, not within the monastery, not outside the monastery, not too hidden, not too involved, who remains seated and calm despite these threats, whose eyes move from the scriptures to unbind this peasant, who moves from the word to the world, and whose lexio allows him to see the world differently. Gregory goes on to describe another encounter with the king of the Goths, Trotilla, who tried to catch Benedict out by getting one of his retinue to impersonate the king by dressing up in his clothes. And of course, Totila is caught out by the man of prophecy. And again, here's an imagined account from the perspective of Totila. I had heard so much about this man, this monk. I was intrigued by the stories about his wisdom, his second sight, his miraculous powers. I know a lot about power and authority, and so I thought I'd put him to the test. I got my slave to dress up as me and to trick this holy abbot. I suppose with hindsight it was not the most convincing disguise and it didn't take long for him to see through my little game. I felt foolish and fell at his feet. Then to my surprise he lifted me back onto my feet, looked straight at me, telling me that I had to change my ways and that my power and authority would last only for nine years and then I would face the one with real power. Well, it's now ten years on, and I know the man of God was right, but I don't seem to be afraid of death. Those few moments with him changed me. The final story I'd like to share with you from the dialogues is his last encounter with his sister, Scholastica. They would meet up once a year just outside the monastery at a short distance, on monastery property. She was a nun and they would discuss things about their spiritual lives and this last encounter St Gregory describes Scholastica wanting to prolong their discussion and Benedict feeling that he needs to be back in his monastery tries to fob off his sister um, and saying I have to leave and so she prays and here, finally, is the last of these imagined monologues from her perspective. Sometimes he just wouldn't listen. Strange, really, when you think how often he encouraged others to listen. I wanted him to be my older brother, not the Holy Father. He knew me better than anyone else. 
even though we met up only once a year. When we talked, I could be myself and share all my doubts and questions, and his heart always seemed big enough for the two of us. I knew I was dying, and I needed his wisdom, his time. But tonight he was, well, he was just annoying and stubborn, saying he had to get back to his brothers. What about his sister? I realized I had nothing to lose, and like any sibling trying to prove an argument, I appealed to a higher authority. To my delight and his horror, my silent prayer was answered. The rain was torrential, the wind ferocious, and his face was a picture. And so because of that rain, they spend the whole night together discussing the things of heaven because three days later, Scholastica dies. And St. Gregory concludes saying, Benedict found a miracle coming from a woman's heart. Nor is it any surprise that the woman who wished to see her brother for a longer time was on this occasion stronger than he, for according to the words of John, God is love. And by an altogether fair judgment, she was able to do more because she loved more. There are many other stories one could look at from the dialogues. I've tried just to give you a, a cross-section of some of the different examples. Um, as I said, if you want to follow up some of these, if you look on the website, that page will give you some of the references to an online version of the dialogues, um, which will enable you to follow those up. Um, I hope you have found uh, this life of, of St. Benedict uh, interesting and helpful. It's, um, I think it's a, a document, uh, an account well worth studying, um, and I hope you find it equally fruitful. And so may God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.